Good afternoon. Welcome to IPI. Today's policy forum is on the EU-UN partnership in peace operations, lessons learned, and the way forward. My name is Adam Smith. I'm a senior fellow here uh, at the IPI Center for Peace Operations. I'd first like to thank our partners in this initiative, the governments of Italy and Germany, the Center for International Peace Operations, ZIF, the European Union, and the UN Departments of Peacekeeping Operations and Field Support. This particular initiative, which is being implemented under the six-month Italian presidency of the Council of the European Union, has its roots in a meeting that IPI and ZIF first held back in Berlin in October 2012. That meeting was part of IPI's Being a Peacekeeper series, which brings together senior government officials with senior UN officials um, to discuss ways of enhancing the contribution of that region to UN peacekeeping. Back in 2012 in Berlin, we heard a lot of interest, but also a lot of questions from the officials of European governments. Uh, you can actually find the meeting report just outside the door there if you're interested. Since that time, we've seen very promising contributions to the UN mission in Mali by a group of European countries, as well as the deployment of the EU mission in CAR to help support the AU mission and the French forces there. We see this project as a continuation of that dialogue. Over the next six months, we'll be discussing issues like mandate coherence between EU and UN missions, training efforts, security sector reform, but it is also hoped that we can focus as well on the question of direct European participation in UN peace operations. As you know, Europeans were integral in providing military support to the earliest UN peacekeeping operations. UN, European contributions in the post-Cold War period peaked at about 35,000 in 1993. Today, about 6,500 European uniformed personnel serve as blue helmeted and blue berated peacekeepers. Just this week, uh, our panelist, uh, Under Secretary General Ladzus, briefed the Security Council on the immense challenges the Secretariat faces in starting up a new and very ambitious peacekeeping operation in the Central African Republic. Among other issues, he highlighted the urgent need for airlift capacity, logistics, and other enablers. These are key capability gaps that, if not filled, will certainly impact the mission's ability to implement its multifaceted mandate. Over the next six months, through these dialogues, we hope we can creatively explore all the ways for the EU and the UN to work together more effectively, as well as for individual European states to help fill these critical capability gaps in UN peace operations. And with those words, I would like to thank our esteemed panelists for being with us today to kick off this initiative and to share their thoughts on such issues. I will now pass the floor to the moderator and chair of today's event, Tobias Peets from ZIF, to kick off our discussion. Thank you, Tobias. Thank you very much, Adam, for your kind words of welcome. Well, I welcome everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, pretty surprised that even the change of dates uh, didn't change the, the great interest for, for this event, so we're quite happy about that. Um, excellencies, uh, Mr. Latsus, uh, dear colleagues and friends, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to welcome you to quite a distinct panel on the occasion of the launch of the called the EU-UN Partnerships in Crisis Management and Operations Best Practices and Next Steps Initiative. And um, I'm quite happy about the, the shape the whole initiative, initiative has taken so far. Adam referred to uh, 2012 when we had a very interesting event on, on, uh, on the Being a Peacekeeper series in, in Berlin. And, um, and we're, we're glad that Italy and Germany um, have taken the lead on this initiative and uh, putting this under the Italian presidency of the EU Council, I think comes uh, as a very nice coincidence because as, as some of you might know, um, there are actually two key documents that define the cooperation between the European Union and the United Nations on, on peacekeeping. And those two documents actually were, um, were implemented under the last German presidency of the EU Council and under the last Italian presidency of the EU Council. So somehow <laughs> this is quite nice that uh, um, in this uh, second half of 2014, we continue this, uh, this cooperation on that issue. 
Um, we had a, a stakeholder workshop meeting already in New York in March um, at the, the permanent mission of, of Ireland and our Irish colleagues, I hope they're here, were also quite supportive back then. And uh, we were all very, very, um, very pleased how, how constructive and very engaged all partners were there at the table. And Adam already referred to that we have IPI on, on board, we have the European Union Institute for Security Studies, we have um, a lot of individual partners, but I think most importantly we're happy and also the Italian and German government are happy that both DPKO and also the European External Action Service from the beginning have been very supportive and very much interested in this initiative. Um, in March, at that meeting, from the variety of, of issues that you could discuss when you're talking about EU-UN cooperation, we all agreed on, on four key areas that during this initiative we will have a, a, a deeper look into in, uh, in the second half of this year. Um, the first one is, is what we call uh, planning and coherence and mandates for EU and UN missions in the field. The second one will be uh, looking into the cooperation of the two uh, organizations in the field of justice and security. Um, the third one will deal with military capabilities. And uh, last but not least, uh, we will also have a closer look into the training cooperation of the two agencies, which actually has been also going on for quite a long time and is taking new shape also with new reforms of both agencies regarding their training architectures and measures. And. Um, well, each speaker will provide a, a short input today, and, um, and after that we will open up the floor for a discussion. And um, uh, without further ado, I would like to refer to our first speaker, Ambassador Lambertini, the Charge d'Affaires of the Permanent Mission of Italy to the United Nations. So welcome, and thank you very much. The floor is yours. <clears throat> thank you, thank you very much. Um, first of all, two very quick remarks. First one is my, the apologies of the Ambassador Card, the Italian and Permanent Representative of Italy. Uh, he, he was very interested to be part of this panel, but um, very serious and very sad family matters obliged him to leave for Italy some hours ago. The second one, uh, um, it's the first time that I, I met my colleague Aiko since last Sunday, so my compliment for the brilliant tenure of German team in the World Cup. Uh, welcome to the four-star winning club, <laughs> a very exclusive club where there are just to member Italy and Germany. And since we have here the, um, the Ambassador uh, Harting, I just would like to stress it's the third time row that the European team win the World Cup. Never happened before. But moving to more serious uh, issues, uh, Monsieur le Secretary General, um, uh, Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Threats and challenges to international peace and security require a coherent, coordinated approach from the international community. They are also require appropriate conflict prevention and management policies and procedures. This is why the UN is striving to modernize and innovate its peacekeeping operations. It is an improving logistic and administrative practices, strengthening infrastructure and policy capacity, adopting new technologies and enhancing cooperation between missions. Last but not least, the UN is a consolidating partnership with member states and regional and sub-regional organizations. Looking forward, we will need to develop those partnerships more and more, say the Assistant Secretary General for, for peacekeeping operation and more, Moulet, an international peacekeeping day the last May 29. Many regional and sub-regional organizations have long histories of cooperation with the United Nations in conflict prevention and mediation, peacekeeping and peacebuilding. Cooperation between the UN and the EU in conflict prevention and management has become a major component of global security governance today. New York and Brussels share similar objectives and are thus natural partners in peacekeeping. In a 2010 statement to the Security Council, the EU High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, Lady Ashton, said, the reasons behind the creation of the United Nations are similar to those that originally drove European integration, to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. Today, the United Nations and the European Union needs to promote the ideas that inspire the whole generation in a new world. Italy has a long-standing commitment to supporting both the European Union and the United Nations crisis management and peacekeeping um, operation. We are the top contributors 
of blue helmets among the UN member states, with more than 1,000 peacekeepers deployed in uh, UN peacekeeping operations, and the seventh top contributor to the nation peacekeeping budget. Our decisive contribution um, to the United Nations interim force in Lebanon, the UNIFIL, and the leadership of the Italian general have been recognized in it. Through the United Nations Global Service Center in Brindisi, Italy offers direct major support to the UN logistic efforts. We also provide active assistance to the United Nations in the pre-deployment pre training of police officers through the Center of Excellence for Stability Police Units, the so-called COESPO in Vicenza, which works very, very closely with the United States police capacity in Brindisi. Italy is a strong supporter of the innovation and modernization of UN's peacekeeping, enabling the organization to face new threats and challenges, especially the protection of civilians. The MONUSCO program, the, sorry, the MONUSCO uh, un unarmed, Unmanned Armed Vehicles, UF programs, is a te technological first for the UN. The permanent mission of Italy is proud to have co facilitated this year report of the special. Committee on Peacekeeping Operation, which for the first time mentioned the use of such technological tools to enhance situational awareness and force protection. It is in the same spirit that my country also strongly supported the EU action in crisis management. Together with Germany, we have deployed the human resources to all 16 common security defense policy missions. The traditional area of expertise of our armed forces, which include the specific policy capacity, the Carabinieri, can make civil and military cooperation more effective in assisting populations afflicted by natural disasters, adding to the crisis management capabilities. Under Italy presidencies of the European uh, Union Council in 2003, Renew with the European Union and UN cooperation in crisis management began through the adoption of the joint declaration of EU, EU UN cooperations in crisis management. The declaration established a consultative mechanism to improve coordination in the areas of mis mission planning, civilian and military training, communication, and the sharing of best practices. Many significant achievements have followed since then. A priority of the EU security strategy of December 2013 was strengthening the United Nations, equipping it to fulfill its responsibilities and to act effectively. In 2007, under the German presidency of the European Union, a joint statement of EU and cooperation in crisis management was adopted, reflecting lessons learned on the African continent where both the organization missions were more and more interconnected. New momentum for UN partnership was generated by the creation of the European External Action, Action Services and the adoption in June 2012 of, the, of an EU plan of action for CDSP support to UN peacekeeping, which defined clear steps and deadline for the cooperation of the two organizations. The action plan recognized that supporting effective multilateralism and contributing to UN efforts in peacekeeping have been, since the inception of the CSPD, at the forefront of UN engagement in the field of crisis management. EU UN partnership is heavily operations driven. A recent pragmatic example, the mission of the, in the Central African Republic, in April, the Foreign Affairs Council stressed that the EU4 car missions, by providing temporary support for a maximum period of six months, should contribute to providing a, secu a secure environment in the Bangui area, which a view to handing over operation to MISCA or to a hand peacekeeping operation. EO4 car comprises some 1,000 military and police troops from 13 participating states and an Eurogen for integrated policy unity. The MINUSCA peacekeeping operation was established by resolution 2149, while the handover from EO4 car to the broader MINUSCA entails cooperation at all levels, thus making the EU UN partnership closer than ever. There are many other examples of the value of close cooperation in crisis management of the organization. Just to name a few, there is UNSMIL in Libya with, with 15 UN agencies on the ground 
or maybe were on the ground with uh, the last development, and the EUBAM Libra CSDP missions, the UNMIC and the EULEX CSDP missions in Kosovo and in Somalia, the <coughs> EU CDP miss training mission EUTM Somalia, and the EU Nansen mission. Finally, the EUTM Mali and the EU MINUSMA missions. Those are examples that underline the European Union support for the values, purposes, and principles embodied in the United Nations Charter. The UN Secretary Council welcomes close operation between the United Nations and the European Union, encouraging both organizations to further strengthen their institutional relations and strategic partnership, including through regular briefing by the European Union High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy to the Security Council. In light of these developments, two years after the adoption of the Plan of Action, the, Itali the current Italian presidency of the European Union would like to take stock of the best practice and lessons learned in this cooperation and further build, sorry, build on this partnership. This is why we are pleased to us with Germany and with the support of the Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna and the Center for International Peace Operation, ZIF, the International Peace Institute that hosts us and the European Union Institute for Security Studies, two high-level regional seminars. The seminar will take place during the Italian presidency and will be in Rome and Berlin, followed by a final conference in Brussels. The Rome seminar, October 22 and 23, will be dedicated to military and policies capabilities, as well as training strategies, standard, and delivery. The seminars will be followed on October 24th by an international seminar in the framework of the Europe New Training Initiative for Civilian Crisis Management, focused on the issues of pre-deployment training of civilian crisis management personnel. Mr. Chair, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, as a, founding member, as a founding member of the European Union, Italy firmly believes in the vision of the United States of Europe and the unique European foreign and defense policies. Italy has always embraced the vision and the value of the Union National Charter. The UN and the EU are two sides of the same coin, two paths leading to the same goal, a peaceful world. For this, we need more Europe in US peacekeeping and in my country is proud to be on the front line together with Germany and all other willing partners in this commitment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Lambertini, for, for laying the floor here. Um, I didn't think about a, a World Cup reference myself, so, <laughs> but, but of, of course, it's, it's also nice to, to then hand over from one four-star World Cup nation to the other four-star <laughs> World Cup nation. And uh, Ambassador Heiko Thoms, Charge d'Affaires of the Permanent Mission in Germany, of Germany to the UN, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, excellencies, uh, Mr. Latsus, uh, colleagues and friends. Uh, well, first of all, of course, uh, special thanks to Inigo for his uh, kind words on the World Cup. I have to say, though, uh, and I want to stress this here, that my personal contribution was very limited uh, in the final. <laughs> yeah. Ambassador Lambertini um, has already explained the overall rationale um, of the project launched by the Italian EU presidency, and we are very happy uh, to uh, cooperate uh, in this project, along with the, the Berlin-based uh, Center for International Peace Operations, CIF. And uh, let me say here that we are very, pl um, in very um, proud to have CIF in Berlin. I think you're doing great work, and uh, thank you very much for all you're doing and also what you're doing today. Um, so since uh, Ambassador Lambertini has already said uh, what the uh, overall rationale is, I will limit myself to um, some brief remarks on the Berlin seminar, which uh, will be held in November this year, and on how we hope uh, that uh, this seminar will feed into uh, the broader discussion uh, here in New York, but also in Brussels. Um, we feel that uh, uh, this project is timely. Uh, there is a growing sense that uh, peace operations need to be made more effective to meet the multiple challenges they face. To that end, the uh, UN Secretary General has announced uh, the peacekeeping review. I'm sure you're all aware of that. Uh, and our colleagues from Rwanda, uh, they will organize an open debate in the Security Council later this month on the regional, the regional dimension of peacekeeping, which we uh, also think is uh, a key aspect for effective international uh, peace and stability. What we seek to achieve with uh, the Berlin seminar in November is uh, to bring the discussion from a more, um, from, a, from a theoretical to a more practical level. 
Our key goal is to improve cooperation on the ground between peace operations deployed by uh, uh, the EU and the UN by drawing concrete lessons from selected mission settings. We hope that the findings of the workshop and uh, the overall series uh, of events that has been outlined will also feed into uh, the review of uh, UN peace operations announced by the Secretary General. So we will concentrate at the seminar in Berlin on two topics. The first will be coherence in mandates, mission planning and coordination on the ground. The relevant uh, is obvious, the sequential or sometimes parallel deployment of UN and EU peace operations has uh, become the norm rather than the exception, especially in Africa but also uh, elsewhere. The EU has become a key partner for the UN in peacekeeping along with the African Union, but with more such deployments on the ground we also have more lessons to be learned on what works in that partnership and what uh, needs to be improved. Um, it is clear that resources are limited. I myself have uh, I've just uh, participated again in the uh, painstaking exercise of negotiating uh, the peacekeeping budget in the Fifth Committee. So I know um, um, what the situation is like. So synergies are required and uh, this is what we want to get at. How should, this all, um, how should all this be factored into the planning process of both organizations? How could respective mandates reflect this partnership on the ground? What are the requirements for improved cooperation, including operational, legal and resource aspects? These are some of the questions we want to address at the seminar. The second topic we want to address in Berlin will be EU-UN cooperation in security and justice. Policing, security sector reform, judicial reform have become key tasks not only for UN but also for EU peace operations. They are also key elements for an exit strategy for peace operations. In addition, more strategic aspects come to mind such as the need for the development of joint guidance material, strategic documents and structures to improve synergies and avoid overlap. So how can we ensure that uh, efforts both by the UN and the EU feed into each other rather than develop in parallel? How can headquarters and member states' policies and priorities be better brought in line? And what are the comparative advantages of both organizations and how can we capitalize on them? Um, of course, each of these uh, topics uh, could easily warrant an entire seminar, but we have only one day. We will uh, therefore focus uh, on a select number of concrete cases to ensure that discussions will be focused. Such cases could be Mali, Central African Republic, Congo, each of which uh, currently hosts uh, both UN and EU operations, but there are other examples. We also want to hear from practitioners on all sides to keep the discussion as operational as possible. And we, of course, very much hope that you, Mr. Latsous, uh, will also be able uh, to participate along with the other key UN staff uh, from New York and also uh, selected heads of missions as well as uh, force commanders and police commissioners uh, from UN and EU missions. So I hope this has uh, given you uh, some sense of what we intend to do uh, in Berlin uh, in November and we'll be very happy to provide you uh, with additional information uh, if you're interested. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Holmes, for your remarks. And uh, after now hearing the two member states, um, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to give the floor to Under Secretary General um, Evi Latsus um, for providing the UN perspective on, on the EU UN partnership and maybe also some lessons learned and uh, follow up for the next time. The floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. And let me first uh, thank IPI for uh, hosting this event. And of course, uh, expressing gratitude to Italy and Germany for uh, organizing this whole sequencing of uh, meetings, which is indeed uh, uh, something that looks very promising. I think the decision of the Italian government to place this issue of the partnership between the UN and the EU in crisis management as one of the key themes of uh, your presidency, it's not new. I do remember that the first joint declaration between the two organizations was under a previous uh, Italian presidency 11 years ago. So there is continuity and I think I want to thank you for this commitment. This comes of course at a very important uh, time because uh, first uh, we are reaching a stage where we now have an opportunity or will have soon to look back on uh, what it is that we've done together on the ground, uh, specifically in uh, Mali and Central African Republic. 
and I'll come back to that. Uh, but also because by the end of the year we will reach the final, uh, impl the, the end of the implementation phase of the action plan to enhance uh, CSDP support to UN peacekeeping and uh, that will be the topic for the meeting in Brussels. And uh, we will need to discuss what comes after that action plan, taking account of uh, uh, where it is that uh, we have not made enough progress, but also where it is that uh, we should focus maybe in 2015 and beyond. Because really, uh, since I took office almost three years ago, this has been one of my priority areas, to uh, recognize the importance of our partnership and try to push it. Uh, and of course, uh, not in a vacuum, because uh, for the last two and a half years, my one of my principal messages to the EU and its member states, as well as, of course, to, to NATO, has been that as we were nearing the exit phase of uh, IFAS in Afghanistan, the time was come maybe to uh, for member states uh, of the European Union to consider uh, coming back to uh, United Nations uh, peacekeeping. And this is something that we are gradually seeing the uh, engagement of Ireland in the Golan Heights in Undorf last year, the engagement uh, later of the Netherlands and now Swit uh, Sweden in Mali. And I was in Mali yesterday, last week and I saw what was happening on the ground. It's very impressive. I think uh, there are, of course, uh, matters to uh, discuss. And uh, I was quite pleased that Ireland, for instance, a couple of weeks ago, organized a specific meeting on command and control because I know this is one of the issues that, uh, looking back uh, 20 years ago, need to be addressed somehow to reassure, you know, that uh, we have made progress on this and that uh, it is something that we need to uh, continue working further upon. So uh, I think this is all uh, very useful and indeed uh, I can say that the cooperation uh, between us uh, in crisis management and peacekeeping is getting stronger, is in fact stronger than ever. That's what I told uh, the ambassadors of COPS, uh, sorry, you say in English uh, PSC, I think, and also took part for the first time in a meeting of the chiefs of defense staff in Brussels in May. And uh, this, I think, needs to be uh, repeated. It works at every level. I mean, uh, from the top between Ban Ki-moon and uh, Lady Ashton, uh, uh, myself at a more modest level with uh, Maciej Popovsky and uh, Nick Westcott and General de Rousier and so on. And uh, the fact that we now have twice a year a steering committee on crisis management, which is really a very, very substantial event where for 24 or 36 hours we really go in depth on the issues in uh, maximum transparency. I think it's, uh, it's very good. Uh, it's with the EU, it's with member states. Uh, I'm very pleased that thanks to Ireland uh, almost two years ago uh, and others, I am now a regular participant in the informal meeting of defense ministers of the EU. Uh, the engagement uh, between the PSC and the Security Council, the fact that, as uh, Ambassador Tom just said, uh, there are regular briefings and there will be more including by SRSGs, uh, but above all, again, on the ground, uh, Mali, CAR already mentioned, but also uh, DRC and uh, Kosovo, where it is a fact of everyday life that we work together. <coughs> one, when one looks back to 11, uh, 11 years ago, when uh, Artemis operation was launched in uh, Eastern Congo, I think uh, one theme that has been coming out regularly is the need to engage very early, as early as possible, and to have extremely close contacts during the, uh, the planning phases and the transition phases of our respective missions. And, uh, you know, I think uh, what we've seen recently in Central African Republic, uh, for the first time, I believe, uh, both uh, External Action Service and uh, um, UN Secretariat, both DPKO and DPA, came together to produce uh, a joint analysis of the conflict. And that shows the depth of the confidence that exists uh, between us and uh, the desire to work together. 
Uh, and uh, if we look at Congo, for instance, uh, well, uh, the same uh, consta applies, the including in the context of the strategic review of uh, ULEX. So I think uh, we have now agreed, uh, based on this experience, that uh, uh, there has to be joint guidelines uh, with the external action service to how to cooperate during the assessment and the planning phases. And only recently there was a very useful workshop between military colleagues on both sides to uh, deepen the engagement precisely during that planning phase. So indeed, the earlier we engage at all levels, uh, the more effective our cooperation uh, will be. And uh, as we consider, as the, both the Security Council and the PSC consider the mandates of the respective missions, that also, I think, uh, applies. Uh, something uh, which strikes me, uh, or maybe not, is that uh, more often than not, there is um, perhaps not as much communication as there should be between um, ambassadors uh, in New York and uh, Brussels. And, uh, uh, but I think now, indeed, all these institutional uh, developments are helping in bridging that gap. And please do not forget I'm an European and uh, uh, that uh, I take uh, <laughs> part in that uh, constat. Uh, and of course, the uh, liaison offices we have both here and in uh, Brussels uh, play an important role. So I think we are getting better at sustaining our engagement and cooperating much more systematically across a wide area of uh, a wide range of areas. Uh, CAR, for example, we have developed a detailed transition matrix uh, across all the fields, political, military, police, corrections, support areas. Um, and of course, uh, we do not forget, quite the contrary, the lessons we learned from the transition between uh, U4 Chad and Minur Kat uh, five years ago. At the same time, uh, we are aware that uh, the African Peace Facility provides the, UA, the EU with a very specific and, I must say, a great tool uh, to, uh, you know, uh, provide uh, funding and make an input in uh, all that is being made. That is the case certainly in uh, our CAR. Uh, and I was pleased when I briefed the Security Council yesterday to acknowledge that uh, the relative stabilization in Bangui owes much to uh, the deployment of u 4 car recently. I think it is making a difference both in the sector of uh, the airport and in the third and fifth arrondissement, which are by far the more sensitive ones in, uh, in Bangui, and that helps uh, open uh, access to a number of places. It also frees uh, MISCA uh, and Sangari's troops, you know, to uh, be available to patrol elsewhere and cover a larger part of uh, the uh, country. And I was a witness to the way on the ground there is coordination between uh, MINUSCA, between MISCA, between UFOCAR, bet with uh, Sangaris. Uh, I think uh, this uh, is, of course, uh, a positive factor when we think ahead of the rehatting uh, of MINUSCA in mid-September. And uh, I should mention that I made the point to uh, European colleagues and to the PSC that uh, I think it would be very worthwhile for the European Union to consider uh, somewhat along the model of EUTM in Mali uh, last year, not to train the army this time. Uh, the army, it was in Mali. The gendarmerie, I think it should be in the case of the CRR, because the gendarmerie is the only remaining institution that was not completely shattered by the events. You know, there are still some elements that can be brought together, and I think that would really serve uh, the purpose. And of course, I am hopeful that some. Uh, participants in u 4 car will consider by mid-December the possibility of being rehatted under MINUSCA. We already had a few uh, promising signals, so um, we're always in need of uh, professional staff officers, of uh, enablers, but this will come, will mature uh, as we go. 
And of course, uh, defense sector reform will be a crucial uh, issue, and the EU, I think, will be a crucial partner uh, for this. Uh, the defense sector reform is a very complex task ahead, uh, but um, I think uh, we will have much to uh, work together about. And, and I say this as a European, which I still have somewhere, somehow, that uh, the EU is not only uh, financier. Uh, you know, of course, we look to the EU resources, but I keep telling my colleagues here in the Secretariat that the EU is also a political creature. It's first and foremost a political creature, and that has to be acknowledged, not only the financial input, but also the uh, action on the political front. And, well, one does have to mention finances. Uh, I think that uh, the first ever multi-donor trust fund of the EU is being established in the CRR. Uh, it's called by its name, by the way, uh, Becou, which means uh, l'espérance. Uh, so that uh, is going to be extremely uh, useful. Defense sector reform remains a crucial subject in most of those countries in which we act jointly together. And uh, Mali, I think, is a clear illustration of this. Uh, of course, one could argue that the Malian army has not shown itself at its best during the uh, May events in Kidal, and uh, might raise questions about the UTM model, but that's still a fresh experience, one that does serve a purpose. I think it has to be clear that you do not recreate an army from basically scratch in just a few months. It's a long range and in-depth uh, work and something that uh, clearly is necessary, uh, but as is necessary, uh, the strengthening of the command and control mechanism, the accountability, the governance of the defense sector, all this comes into a much uh, wider picture, uh, wider picture for which we as MINUSMA are mandated. Uh, but again, we will need to, uh, to work uh, together, as we need also to work, uh, especially with the External Action Service, on the uh, civilian uh, aspects. Uh, you have now this mission in support of law enforcement institutions, uh, UCAP uh, uh, Mali Sahel, uh, and that, of course, has also to do with uh, the police reform on the higher end. So I think on the ground we have an effective uh, division of labor, we have good complementarity, and that has uh, to uh, continue. Of course, now, still in Mali, we have this big challenge of how to deploy the police in a sustainable way in northern Mali. Uh, I was there last week, as I said, and the picture is still uh, quite bleak, uh, but we'll see whether the Algiers uh, meeting this week on uh, reconciliation will bring about perhaps a, a rosier political uh, impression. Uh, all in all, I think uh, both institutions are very well placed to ensure that all these support actions are well prioritized, well combined, well sequenced, and uh, of course uh, using both the political, the security, and the development tools, you know, in a way that is uh, really focused, and uh, this has to be a constant priority for us. At the uh, next event in Rome, we will focus also on training and military capabilities, uh, especially the issue of enablers and force multipliers. I was uh, in a position earlier this year to share with EU member states the gaps that we as the UN face. There's a long list of them, and not only about helicopters or things like that, but it's across the whole spectrum. And uh, I think uh, this is indeed what is happening. The fact that the Netherlands, Sweden now are making those important contributions to uh, MINUSMA. I visited, for instance, the new 
uh, as food that's uh, um, all sectors, uh, intelligence, fusion unit, you know, all sources, sorry. Uh, these acronyms are impossible. But <laughs> I must say the institution is a great thing and uh, the Dutch are doing a splendid performance coupled with the uh, evolutions of their special forces in the northern part of Mali. It's quite impressive, very promising, and I think it's writing a new page that will certainly come uh, f very useful for other missions uh, in the future, for instance, maybe in the CAR. Let me finally touch about um, the issue of rapid deployment, because that is one of our concerns, illustrated in Mali last year, in South Africa this year. We have to be uh, in a position to deploy very quickly. And of course, I've been following in my new detail the debate in the EU about battle groups. Now, I know this is a sensitive issue, uh, that it was decided not to go into a battle group for Central Africa early this year. Uh, okay, but uh, I think yet that this is um, a major concept, you know, the, maybe I could say I have a dream. I have a dream that in certain circumstances uh, the EU could come in with a battle group, you know, and establish a bridgehead in a country which would give us the few months uh, that we need to actually deploy. That was the original idea of Artemis in 2003. Uh, so whatever we can do to uh, make it happen, I think, is something I will continue to plead for. And of course, we have to keep in mind the uh, developments or the uh, virtual developments so far. But I think it's coming, it's maturing within the African Union, about the African standby force, about ASIRC, the African uh, crisis Crisis, immediate crisis response, uh, something, ASIRC, anyway. Uh, this is very promising. Uh, we support the AU in all these projects. You support them. I think at the end of the day, uh, the three uh, potentials could uh, join, you know, and uh, make it, uh, make things happen on the ground that have not been uh, really totally possible uh, so far. And I think to my mind, this is one of the priority areas and one area in which we can and should do uh, better. So I think uh, more work is necessary and I think, let me say again, that all these events that are planned in the coming months will certainly serve the purpose, you know, of furthering the reflection, making people more aware of, above all, the need to continue making progress. So uh, thank you again for this uh, initiative, for our friends of uh, both ZIF and uh, IPI, and um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Latsus, for providing the UN perspective. Actually, I can, I can share some information about the Rome Seminar with you. We will be discussing your dreams, so um, there, is, uh, there is a strong interest also from the Italian side to actually talk about the battle groups, and we'll see what this is going to, to solve. And, um, well, I think it was good that you, that you also put somehow the whole UN-EU cooperation into uh, a wider perspective, because it's also about UN and member states' cooperation, so all the bilateral cooperations as well. And this is also part of the of the action plan that was mentioned many times, and um, I think that um, Ambassador Meyer Harting from the EU delegation uh, will probably also talk a little bit more about the EU action plan and maybe also shed some light on on the issues there. So, um, welcome also to the panel, uh, Ambassador. He's Charles Daffer of the permanent of the um, no, he's head of the delegation here at the, um, uh, in New York, and uh, the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you very much, and thank you also to the our two member states uh, who have taken the initiative uh, to organize uh, this event. I would also evidently start out by congratulating Germany uh, on its uh, football success, uh, which for an Austrian, I can tell you, is a great uh, uh, step forwards. And I have to say that we were very pleased with this. And I would also say that um, uh, this is one of the areas where member states are active nationally. In one case, even uh, one member state even has more than one team, as you know, in international, <laughs> uh, in the international in the international arena, uh, whereas uh, the subject that we're discussing today is in 
fact a subject where there have been decisive moves also in our internal organization uh, since the uh, Treaty of Lisbon, because in fact it is now the institutional actors of the European Union uh, who have the lead in coordinating and leading evidently these European uh, efforts. And for this reason, uh, um, Hervé Latsus also uh, spoke at some length about the very intensive contacts he has with the European External Action Service uh, at all sorts of levels uh, in Brussels, the External Action Service, the, what we basically in other terms could call the European Diplomatic Service or European uh, Foreign Ministry in a certain sense. And evidently, we uh, uh, follow these efforts here as a delegation. And uh, as you've understood, the contacts that exist with uh, Brussels are so intense that and so direct that we sometimes even have difficulties in following up everything that is happening at these various levels. I think it's very important that Under Secretary General Latsus uh, participates uh, in these in the informal defense ministers' meetings, that he also now meets with the uh, chiefs of defense staff, uh, that we have the regular meetings that he's referred to with the political and uh, security committee, the PSC uh, of the European Union, that Lady Ashton uh, has these very regular contacts, including on security issues uh, with the uh, secretary general. And um, I have to say that it is an additional challenge, as you rightly said, uh, to intensify contacts uh, from here between New York and Brussels. We certainly are on a daily, uh, uh, in daily contacts uh, with our own headquarters, with the uh, p political and security committee. There's such an obvious interlinkage between what that committee discusses and what happens here in New York. And we're involved uh, in uh, so many uh, uh, comparable fields that a uh, constant exchange of notes, a constant cooperation is necessary. And I know that the same, of course, is true uh, at the level of my ambassadorial colleagues here uh, with, their, uh, with, their co with their ambassadors in Brussels and more uh, particularly the representatives to the PSC. And I have to say that the new dialogue that we've established, direct dialogue between the members of the PSC and the members of the Security Council once or twice a year and the many visits that the uh, senior leadership, senior management of the, uh, U, uh, of the UN pays to Brussels are very helpful in this context as well. Uh, uh, that I would perhaps start uh, by uh, uh, with one more general comment. The engagement of the European Union and of its member states is based internationally what we call on, on what we call the comprehensive approach. So I think it's perfectly right uh, that um, uh, uh, for Hervé Latsus to uh, to point out that the the old adage that the European Union is not a, a, a global a global player, but is a global payer wherever it goes, has been overtaken by events in many cases. Our contribution is far more than financial. And when it comes to security, our contribution is far more than exclusively military. And the best example that I can give for this is undoubtedly our engagement in the Horn, on the Horn of Africa and in Somalia, which is plastic, uh, the, the, the most illustrative example of the variety of things we do. We have the uh, Operation Atalanta there, our anti-piracy operation, where we operate on the basis of a mandate of the United Nations Security Council uh, to combat piracy in the waters surrounding Somalia. At the same time, we have uh, run a, a training mission for the uh, Somali forces, uh, first in neighboring countries, then in Somalia proper, um, because um, uh, evidently helped them uh, combating uh, terrorism and, and, and uh, within uh, and, and, and military and uh, co coping with military challenges in their own country. But even that would be incomplete if at the same time you don't look at the development uh, engagement of the European Union and the humanitarian uh, engagement. The European Union, uh, as you probably know, and its member states together uh, provide something like 60% of world uh, uh, governmental development aid. And wherever we are, we are under normal circumstances. And that is also right for Somalia. The greatest uh, uh, provider, we together with member states and some of our member states, Italy in particular, are particularly engaged in uh, in Somalia. Um, we are also great providers of uh, of development aid, and we are also internationally, I think, the greatest supporters of the humanitarian effort.
efforts of the uh, of the United Nations and of the international community, including in that part of the world. So, I mean, when you speak, and a lot has been said today about our actors in the field of military security policy in the uh, in the closer uh, uh, sense of the word, and uh, Avi Latsus naturally uh, is in constant contact uh, with them. But I mean, when you see uh, people like the Commissioner uh, for Development coming here, Mr. Pibalks, uh, or the uh, Commissioner uh, for Humanitarian Affairs, uh, Mrs. Georgieva, it's not surprising that they interact here with the Secretary General and also with political actors. Mrs. Georgieva had a remarkable uh, event here uh, on the situation in the Central African Republic a few months ago, uh, together with uh, uh, with uh, the French Foreign Minister, uh, uh, Mr. Fabius, and Mr. Pibalks, just to give you one example, was part of the high-level international mission of the Secretary General to the Sahel uh, uh, region. And evidently, I don't think you can disconnect uh, these various efforts from each other. They only make sense uh, in a comprehensive uh, overall uh, context. And when it comes uh, more specifically uh, to our, uh, to when it comes more specifically to our military engagement, uh, first of all, of course, there are areas where uh, it is the member states themselves who are primarily engaged, and it is, of course, the member states of the European Union who are the who are the only actors. Uh, from our point of view when it comes to UN-led uh, peacekeeping. On the other hand, of course, uh, there are areas that are also mentioned where we operate as European Union with uh, the support of our member states on the basis of a UN mandate. Uh, in some areas outside of our, our broader region, in some areas because it's a security concern uh, of the European Union. Uh, Kosovo was mentioned uh, which, with our operation, uh, our reparation ULEX there. There, to be honest, uh, from our point of view, the United Nations primarily uh, provides the coverage that is necessary under international law uh, because of the divergences that exist, including amongst our own membership uh, with, uh, with regard to the status of Kosovo, but I mean the, the, the practical work as such is done uh, to a very great extent by the uh, European Union itself. Uh, on another case is uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, where we have an operation uh, that is also based on a, on a United Nations Security Council mandate, but on a con in, uh, in a concern that is primarily a uh, broader European security concern. But one of the other uh, specificities of European security policy, of course, is that it is primarily about crisis management and then of course you're probably aware of the fact that the European Union has no competence whatsoever uh, for crisis management within the territory of the European Union as such. I mean, in this sense, we're different from other regional arrangements. The method and the instrument that we have uh, to ensure peace uh, within uh, the European Union proper are the instruments of European integration. And because we're together in the framework of a union of integration, we don't have any instrument that would provide for managing crisis within the European Union uh, at, a, at a European Union level. Of course, member states of the European Union are part of defense arrangements of their own, uh, more particularly with NATO. But crisis management, when it comes to crisis management in the sense proper of the word, is an activity that we conduct outside of the territory of the European Union. Partly, I have to say, because, I mean, it, it would always be wrong to give the impression that we operate uh, exclusively uh, out of, uh, I mean, you normally, the, the, one of the greatest moving forces in international relations is self-interest. And of course, the reason why we do this crisis management, to put it bluntly, is that we're aware of the fact that if we are not able uh, to uh, export security into our a broader neighborhood, uh, sooner or later, we risk importing insecurity into the uh, European Union. The classic examples are, of course, uh, the classic examples are, of course, uh, the crises that we faced in southeastern uh, Europe. Uh, but I mean, in a certain sense, with all the challenges that, for instance, countries like the current presidency of the Earth Council of the European Union are facing in the field of migration, everybody knows that contributing to the secu security and peace and managing crises on the African continent also has a strong element of self-interest. Um, so I think that, uh, that uh, point uh, also 
has to be made, and I think very strongly that I would uh, insist on this uh, this angle uh, as well. Um, but of course, and and if we deal with crisis management in other parts of the world, there's also the angle of cooperating with other regional organizations. And more specifically, I think it's fair to say the greatest partner we have, and the partner where we have the feeling that we're also under an obligation for many reasons, including historical reasons, to be most supportive besides the United Nations as such, is the African Union. And in many of these instances, you, the, the two uh, hosts of uh, host, uh, member states hosting this uh, event today and IPI have wanted us to focus today on cooperation between the European Union and the United Nations. But again, I mean, if you want the full picture in most of the instances that we're speaking about in Africa in particular, it's a triangular uh, cooperation of the United Nations, the African Union and the European Union. And sometimes uh, you have these discussions about uh, whether we're not getting into the way of other people who want to do these things themselves. And we had an element of this discussion, uh, as some of you know, who were more closely involved in, in this when we spoke about, the, uh, about involvement in the Central African Republic. But I think it is understood from our point of view, we believe extremely strongly in uh, the concept of national and in the broader sense also regional ownership. And um, um, I mean, uh, Avi Latsus has spoken of the concept of the battle groups, and it's true that the battle groups were developed more specifically uh, to, uh, pre uh, to help uh, the United Nations also in bridging situations. And Operation Artemis that he mentioned in a certain sense was the experience that gave birth uh, to this concept. On the other hand, uh, the, main, uh, the main principle is you help somebody if he wants to be helped and if he needs that help and if he asks you for that kind of help, especially when it comes uh, to African friends. We are not here to superimpose ourselves over African structures of crisis management. We are there to help Africans, African friends and African partners uh, to help themselves, if I may put it uh, again as uh, clearly as that. And with all the discussions we've had, I have to say we're very pleased that an African presidency of the Security Council Council, Rwanda has now decided to have a discussion precisely on this subject precisely on the subject of this triangular uh, relationship, because uh, the, the, the event that uh, Rwanda will be organizing under the chairmanship of its foreign minister on the 28th, that is to say, in, in just a few days' time, will be dedicated, that's the way I also understand their concept note, uh, precisely to this cooperation. And we are honored uh, to have been invited uh, at a high level uh, to this discussion. And I think that, um, uh, as far as I uh, can see, it is extremely likely that the Secretary General of the External Action Service, Ambassador Pierre Vimont, uh, will come here uh, on this occasion to brief the Security Council and members about our cooperation in this field. With this, I have to say, very general introduction. I would just say a few uh, technical things, especially also to uh, uh, sort of fulfill the homework task that has been given to me to speak about the plan of action and other activities that we have. I concentrate, I would concentrate, as far as the technical part of my presentation is concerned, on three areas that have uh, shown we, that are of key importance to us in recent years. The plan of action to enhance CSDP support to UN peacekeeping, the UN steering committee on crisis management, and the extensive cooperation that we have in the field. I can start with the last one. I can do them in reverse order, basically because I've already said a lot uh, about what we do in the field. I've already spoken about the cooperation that we have with the UN and with uh, African partners in the Horn of Africa. And by the way, I forgot to mention amongst the many activities that we do in the Horn of Africa that the European Union also plays an important role in financing because I was sort of downplaying the financing side because you were saying that that is not something we do all the time, the financing we do for the AMISOM operation. We have demonstrated our role in responding to the crisis in Mali by deploying U2M and recently also UCAP Sahel Mali to support military and civil SSR efforts to complete coordination and cooperation with MINUSMA, coordination on the implementation of the respective UN, uh, UN Sahel strategies have been important. That's also where Commissioner Pibalks was so strongly involved. We have launched the bridging operation that uh, Avila Sus referred to in the Central African Republic. 
public and uh, we believe that in an innovative and complementary way and with the agreement of the authorities of the Central African Republic, the European Union has started working on reconstructing the national criminal justice chain in areas where UFO is deployed while the United Nations will deploy urgent temporary measures in this regard on a broader scale. I would also say that, and I would fully agree with what Under Secretary General Latsus uh, said, that security sector reform is in fact a very important part of our cooperation. And in fact, he and I will be involved in an event in the summer where we will discuss precisely this, also cooperation between the UN and the United Nations in this field. Uh, all these uh, fields of cooperation are discussed all the time uh, between our, uh, our leadership and the leadership of the United Nations and the various levels of cooperation have already been explained. I should perhaps explain more specifically the UN Steering Committee on Crisis Management. This is the main structured forum we have for discussion at strategic level uh, and um, it, it was uh, created in fact quite some time ago but then I think it's fair to say that during a long period which preceded the arrival of Under Secretary General Latsus it was somewhat somnolent and rather technical and I think that with the, with the, with the increase of cooperation, practical cooperation Operation and with the very direct context that exists between Brussels and uh, and uh, and New York, the nature of this uh, steering committee has changed fundamentally. It's really become an operational forum which meets twice a year, once here, once in uh, in Brussels, and where we discuss in a broad manner all the various fields that we're cooperating in. And the great thing is that beyond this steering committee. As uh, Avedas was explained, uh, everybody here has direct contacts with his counterparts in Brussels, also on the various regional files. And uh, you should never complain uh, as a diplomat accredited uh, uh, somewhere if intensive uh, cooperation between the headquarters intensifies. But as every diplomat knows, it's an additional challenge to you work-wise uh, to keep track on all the things that are happening in these fields. The plan of action. Uh, this is a stru the structured uh, cooperation between the S and the DPKO also engages contacts as working levels, including with UN departments responsible for peacekeeping, uh, the PSC endorsed this plan of action uh, for to enhance EU CSDP support to UN peacekeeping. I'm sorry for all these acronyms, uh, uh, containing 13 different actions. A time frame has been set for its implementation, a total duration of two years up to the end of 2014. It should be noted that the plan itself was does not commit resources as such uh, from the EU or its member states towards the UN but member states will always have the last word as far as the use of their resources in cooperations with the UN is concerned. The plan of action is aimed to provide a tool that enables us to find the best suited mechanisms or arrangement for ensuring operational coherence. Through its use, we also seek those opportunities where the EU can provide practical support to UN uh, peace operations and missions. And just to give you one uh, practical example on that, when the uh, um, United Nations decided to uh, deploy its observer mission uh, uh, to Syria. Uh, um, the one thing they asked us for, uh, in fact, rapidly, was to provide the United Nations with armored cars. And these armored cars, I have to say, um, the European Union is often criticized, and rightly so, for the bureaucratic way in which it operates its administrative processes. But I've never, and I come from a, a national administration, seen a case where a donations of such an important security nature were made so rapidly as these uh, armored cars were provided. And in fact, uh, they had a, an important uh, afterlife after that mission because they served Mrs. Kark in her further mission. And who knows whether uh, uh, they will not be needed now also in, uh, in another uh, context uh, in Syria. So I think this was a practical uh, uh, sort of support that probably an organization like the European Union can provide even more rapidly than member states, and I think it was appreciated. There is, uh, unfortunately, uh, continued demand for UN peacekeeping across the world, and this will also uh, require increased 
EU support, several of our member states have increased their participation in recent months in response to this appeal, such as is the case of individual member states when it comes to peacekeeping in the ne of the Netherlands, for instance, and Sweden in Mali. And it would be fair to testify that all member states uh, approach this issue with an open mind and constructively. The lessons learned by our Dutch and Swedish colleagues will be important for all of us. I would still have a number of things of a more specific nature that I could add, but I think you've been inundated with information uh, from this side of the room. I would only say that security sector reform, as has been said, cooperation in the police field are the areas that are particularly important. The Italian presidency has referred to its very strong experience in, with the, in the field of Carabinieri forces, and everybody knows that one of the greatest challenges in international relations is robust police forces in international peacekeeping. That's certainly a subject that we should discuss, but I'd perhaps make a stop here. So as finally uh, uh, to give the chance to all of you who have uh, on, a, on a day where so much dramatic things are happening, have come here uh, to, uh, to, ex uh, to listen to this subject, the chance to make your own contributions and participate in a discussion to which I'm also prepared to participate. Thank you very much, Ambassador Maya Harting. I think it, it was good that not only you, but also uh, Mr. Latsus both stressed, even though that we focus on EU-UN partnerships, we're actually also putting it into the wider picture of EU-UN-African Union partnerships. And I think this will be also the case with uh, the upcoming series of events. Um, as uh, Mr. Latsus um, has to leave a little bit before five um, already, I think I will not ask additional questions now to the panel, but I think I will just open the floor up to, uh, to the audience and uh, we're happy to maybe collect three or four questions first and then uh, come back to uh, to um, to the panel. And I have our Irish colleague there in, in the back. Um, please, come. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the kind references um, uh, to um, Ireland and uh, to our work uh, from the Undersecretary General and from yourself, Tobias. Um, just, I have a couple of questions. The first one, um, sorry, my name is Colm O'Connell. I'm from the Mission of Ireland. Um, it, the first question I'd like to ask is a, a general big picture quest, uh, question, I suppose. Um, have we already arrived at the limit of EU-UN partnership in crisis management? Um, have we reached the scale of ambition that we want to reach? Um, and what I mean is, uh, you know, as it has been outlined, complementary operations, uh, division of labor, good institutional cooperation, uh, good operational cooperation on the ground. Um, uh, the Under Secretary General mentioned, you know, looking to 2015 and beyond, looking beyond the current plan of action. Um, is there something bigger picture that we can we can aim for? Um, there was some ideas about a uh, joint uh, or, or EU units, qua EU deploying into missions, etc. And just more uh, more ambition, or will it be refining what we've got? That's not a bad thing. I'm just uh, throwing it out there. The second question uh, is for the Under Secretary General in relation to the review of peacekeeping that was announced by the Secretary General. Uh, at the Security Council last month. Um, what's the possibility of, of member state uh, involvement and engagement and support to that review? Is it more of an, will it be more of an internal exercise or a broader exercise? Um, Heiko had mentioned, uh, for example, this seminar series uh, being considered as part of a feed in to the exercise, and presumably partnerships will be a key part of that review. Um, but specifically, uh, just in terms of individual member state, the possibility to uh, engage. And finally, on battle groups, um, and you had mentioned about your your dreaming um, uh, of a battle group deployment. At some point, um, does the dreaming, I suppose, uh, have to be set aside and a more realistic approach, perhaps a more focused and meaningful approach in building African rapid response capability? I know there's work ongoing on that. Um, but should there be a more concerted effort uh, uh, in that route pursued, um, given the, the higher chance, perhaps, of those rapid response capabilities being used at some point? Thanks. Thank you very much, Colm. I um, have a question from the lady in the first row. And please uh, state your name and also your, your institution. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Dr. Danielli of the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies. Considering that today is International Justice Day and that you mentioned that you will speak about justice in, in your second seminar, I believe, uh, and considering the Dutch judgment 
uh, on peacekeeping that came out between yesterday and today. Would you elaborate, please, on the connection? And I don't know whether to ask it structurally, that, that is ICC and peacekeeping, or more conceptually, that is justice, and EU, and AU, and uh, peacekeeping. Uh, would you elaborate more about that? All right, thank you very much. Um, the person on the left with the glasses here, please. Thank you. I'm Victor Casanova from Security Council Report. Mr. Latsus referred to the incidents in Kidal in May and also the fact that some could question EUTM in Mali as a model to follow or not. Uh, I would ask you if you could draw some initial lessons learned about what didn't work and after realizing that some of the battalions involved in the uh, disastrous offensive of Urquidal on the 21st of May had been trained and equipped by the European Union. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as Mr. Latsus has to leave earlier, I would actually start with you, if that is okay, and uh, you can pick a couple of questions, actually, and then we continue with our colleague from the EU and then with the two ambassadors. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for asking these questions. The first one I would take is that of the partnership. Have we reached a limit or can we still make much better? I do think we can make much better. First, we have to deepen uh, what is, and I understand Ambassador Meyer Harting's uh, concern, although whenever possible we associate his office to our telephone or video conferences with the external action service. But it's true that it has become a fact of everyday life that, for instance, uh, Nick Westcott and I call each other, depending on the event, sometimes almost every other day, and we meet regularly whenever the both of us are at the same event in Africa or elsewhere. So I think looking uh, beyond uh, the present state of affairs, I think there is still much, much more that we can do together. It will be a matter of imagination, but I think the, the will is there. It's true that a few years ago the relation was sort of a bit somnolent, uh, but now it's, uh, it's in our DNA uh, to consult, you know, uh, systematically and exchange. So we'll continue on that. The review of peacekeeping that was decided and announced by the Secretary General is something that we are still working towards parametering. Uh, there are various options. Uh, one thing I can tell you for sure is that definitely there will be a need for deep consultation of member states and of partners. Peacekeeping is now in a time of partnership with the EU, with the AU, with others. And that's a fact, and we have to recognize this. So we're not going to work inside a bocal, you know, a glass jar. Uh, we have to be open, we have to be transparent, and uh, consultation, and to some extent, I don't know yet how precisely, but the involvement of uh, member states, in particular troop contributors, uh, will be uh, critical. But as I said, it's still in the making. And I hope that in the coming few weeks we will have a definite uh, uh, work plan on this. Uh, the battle groups, well, uh, that is indeed a dream, but uh, what is important is that also uh, we get uh, more involvement, especially in the post-Afghanistan context of uh, member states, of uh, EU, NATO, both in most instances. Uh, that, as I said, is starting to happen. I'm happy that it's working because we need, you know, uh, uh, experienced staff officers, we need intelligence specialists, we need uh, uh, specialized engineering units, we need uh, top level medical uh, facilities, uh, we need all the enablers, and these are things, you know, that are happening also, that one particular EU country is actually uh, piggybacking uh, an African troop contributor by providing them with APCs, you know, and the upkeep of the APCs, so everybody is happy, everybody benefits. So there are many creative ways, and we have to uh, continue uh, in that direction. About international justice, well, we cooperate on a daily basis with the ICC. Uh, we have also uh, definite uh, involvement in many of our missions in uh, judiciary follow-up because, of course, if you take uh, Central African Republic, for instance, it is very clear that uh, 
impunity has been one of the main reasons why we've had this recurrent, recurring uh, cycles of violence. People know they're not going to be annoyed, you know, okay, imp impunity will be coming anyway, so who cares if I go again into fighting and uh, plundering and all that. So it has to be addressed, of course, in the African context, the ICC is a delicate matter. Uh, I know they are considering that option, but we have already made proposals, you know, to help uh, the Central African authorities who have accepted the principle of what they call urgent temporary measures, which is in effect giving us some executive power in the field of the judiciary. And uh, we are discussing various proposals with uh, Bongi to actually uh, not only support, but be actively involved in the judiciary. And of course, uh, the EU is fully informed and no doubt will help us, including, by the way, in finding um, uh, women judges, because uh, that is an angle that has to be addressed. Uh, on Kidal, uh, well, many things didn't work, clearly. Um, I think uh, I said it earlier, you know, you don't reestablish an army in just a few months, giving basic infantry training to companies is one thing, but uh, restoring a chain of command and control, uh, restoring uh, the uh, governance, uh, that is to say the link between uh, the political authority and the military authorities, and there was definitely in that particular case a huge gap there, which was in part acknowledged by President uh, Keita. Uh, and also, uh, what is very important, you know, in military operations is the sense of moral ascendancy, l'ascendant moral. Troops who go into a fight, you know, without the, the will to make a difference, without the certainty that they will make a difference, well, it just doesn't work. And that's exactly what happened when you saw some garrisons in some places in northern Mali, which were not even <coughs> anywhere near threatened. There were no uh, MNLA elements within 50 kilometers around their little fort, and yet they decided to to just uh, decamp. Uh, but decamp, but leaving behind uh, large numbers of equipment, including uh, mili very military hardware. That was a very unsatisfactory uh, state of affairs, but it's something that will have to be addressed, but over out of necessity uh, period of time. And finally, just for the joke, but as you know, uh, an army of uh, maybe 30,000 that has 150 or so generals uh, is something that raises a few questions. Huh? Um, voilà. Je crois qu'il faut être sérieux à la fin des fins. Hein? Merci. <laughs> Thank you very much, and uh, I would like to, to hand over to Ambassador Maya Harting, maybe also related to what uh, our Irish colleague asked about the, the limitations of the partnership, and maybe also some ideas about potential follow-up for the plan of action. Thank you. Well, uh, first of all, I would say that um, I think that, uh, like uh, Under Secretary General Assus, I think we are at a beginning of a development which will continue and which will uh, intensify. I would clarify that I'm perfectly happy with the intensive direct relations that exist, uh, and I think it's very good that you have these relations. I'm only saying it's a work challenge for us, uh, but a work challenge that we assume happily uh, because of the intensified uh, cooperation that you have. And I think the real qualitative change is precisely that you speak now with the people who deal with regional issues and that you speak with the, also with the, the, those parts in our house which deal with these other aspects of comprehensive uh, security uh, that, we, that we work for and that we work on. Um, I certainly, I, as I said, I think there's more that can be done. I think that in a certain sense what we're doing is indirectly, in fact, intensifying uh, the relations uh, between individual member states and the United Nations when it comes to engagement uh, in Africa. Uh, you know that, and Under Secretary General Latsus always says it, that we're underrepresented Europeans in peacekeeping in Africa, but in fact, we have more Europeans there now in the past precisely because of the European Union uh, engagement. And I think that is also uh, to the benefit, uh, if I may uh, say so, of the 
UN European relationship beyond uh, the European Union. The only point I made earlier on is that I, I don't want to see this, especially when it comes to engagement in Africa, as an isolated uh, challenge of European Union uh, UN relations. I think it's very important to see it in this uh, triangular relationship with the African Union precisely because I think like my Irish colleague, I would be convinced that for this to be sustainable and for this to work in the long run, the whole issue is about strengthening capabilities of the African Union and also of sub-regional organizations in Africa to cope with these challenges. And a very important part of our work is in fact precisely to strengthen uh, peacekeeping uh, capacities, crisis management capacities of the African Union and individual uh, African member states. I can also very briefly say only on, on the ICC and accountability, I think you are very much aware that in terms of that respect for international justice, accountability is one of the policy priorities of the European Union. We've always made it a core issue of our, uh, of our approach uh, to international challenges of this kind. Like others, uh, like uh, most like-minded in this field, we are convinced that peace and justice have to go hand in hand. And as one says so frequently, there can be no durable peace without justice. But on the other hand, it's also difficult uh, to achieve justice uh, in an atmosphere or in a situation where there is no peace. And because uh, others have already spoken of the uh, the dialogue, the not always easy dialogue we have on this subject, including with our African friends. It's very important for us that um, uh, inter uh, accountability and support for the ICC remains a cross-regional and trans-regional issue. This is not a, a European invention imposed on others. It's important that this will only work if it has support and active support from all regions in the world and particularly also uh, from Africa. And in this sense, I think it is very important that uh, in all likelihood uh, for the first time, the conference of state parties of the ICC will have an African uh, president. You know that this has now been uh, presided twice uh, by European colleagues, once by our uh, Liechtenstein uh, colleague who um, uh, who uh, has done tremendous work, Ambassador Venerweser, in promoting this issue, then by our Estonian colleague, Ambassador Intelman, who in fact will now be going to work for the European Union as a European Union ambassador in an African country. Uh, and um, But it's very important now that this becomes a body led by, by an African and therefore we're following closely and with great sympathy the, effort, the efforts of our African friends uh, to find the best possible uh, uh, president of the state conference, or the conference of state parties, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. As we're running out of time, I would, uh, in reverse order, maybe ask Ambassador Thomas and then for uh, final words also Ambassador Lambatini for, uh, for their comments. So please, Ambassador Thomas. And just very briefly, uh, I think uh, most uh, uh, issues have already been addressed, but since I was asked directly by Dr. Daniele, uh, I would just like to respond uh, briefly uh, to your question. Um, what uh, we have in mind with our uh, seminar, and that's what I want to focus on, is uh, just to make clear that peacekeeping is not only uh, about, uh, um, or it does not only have a military side, it's about many things. Uh, it is about policing, about corrections, about uh, prosecution, it's about uh, administration of justice, and uh, these are elements which are sometimes, uh, uh, in certain situations, even more important uh, than maybe uh, the military side. And we think that the EU has uh, particular strength in this uh, field, uh, and uh, this, this is where our uh, efforts can be uh, complementary, uh, they I mean, co can complement each other. Um, Germany also has a very strong interest in policing, but policing is uh, only a first step in most instances. You need uh, then um, pro prosecution, correction, justice. Um, we have uh, founded the group of friends of uh, UN uh, policing. It's a small step, but we'll take it f uh, from there. And uh, this is something we'd also like to make clear. This is the reason I raised uh, this uh, issue. And maybe uh, one personal remark on uh, the question from our Irish colleague. I mean, I was in Brussels in 2007 as a PSC deputy um, when uh, this uh, first document was uh, uh, um, put into force. Of course, we had uh, uh, great expectations and uh, I'm uh, sure we can uh, still uh, uh, work on that. And it's only beginning and not uh, an end where we are now, certainly not an end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ambassador Lambatini. <clears throat> Thank you. I, 
I cannot be more agreed on the, what uh, Ambassador Thomas just said on the major picture of the peacekeeping operation. Actually, uh, we can talk on an endless process with peacekeeping and peace building. This is two faces of a major uh, picture. Uh, and since today, as you remember, it's today on when we remember the signature of the Rome Treaty for International, the, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, um, I would like also to stress a particular aspect, maybe because I'm Italian and because we have the Carabinieri, as I already said. I participated some weeks ago to a very interesting um, seminars on peacekeeping and cultural heritage. Because when we, when we speak, when we talk about the process that not only is military, but also to regave hope, rebuilt, rebuilt a country, needs also rebuilt a culture. And we actually, we have a huge experience on this. If you remember what the Carabinieri made uh, after the great destruction of the Baghdad Museum, basically we re rebuilt the museum. This is one aspect on which we have to talk, maybe because today we are talking, we are stressed now on the after peacekeeping uh, result. Um, in some way, this also um, uh, answer to a question that I remember who raised if the level of cooperation among you and UN are satisfied. We have a lot of work to do because the several phases of this process is still to complete. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, finally, let me let me thank all, all panelists for for their participation and contributions. Let me also thank all of you for participating in in a long afternoon session. And um, we will make sure that when the process now goes on, we will have a series of three events that we also find a way of to how to feed that also back into the New York community. And um, well, you can make sure that that IPI and CIF will always feature also the next events on on their websites and and, and try to to keep you updated on on everything that develops. Um, let me thank IPI for, for hosting this e event. And, uh, and uh, well, I wish you everybody a nice afternoon and a good evening. Thank you very much. Bye.